what were we, about 28? Uh, I don't know. All I know is the formation of peptides. Yeah, I think that was. Wow, I can't believe I remembered that. So peptides are small condensation products of amino acids. They are small. So isn't that my job to read you these PowerPoints? So small compared to proteins. <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, basically peptides are like small polymers of amino acids. Proteins are larger polymers of amino acids. So if they're small, you can call them peptides. Smaller, like as it says, they're less than 10,000 kilodaltons. Or, or not 10,000 kilodaltons. 10,000 daltons or 10 kilodaltons. Does that make more sense? Sorry about that. <laughs> and, and do we know how, how are these polymers made? They're like these condensation reactions where you produce water or dehydration where you're taking water out of both of those to form the, the polymer. And this is called, anybody know? Not an, um, well, what did you say? Amine. Amine? But this is a very special amine. Amide. Or amide bond. What, what is it called? A peptide bond. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very special. We'll learn about more about it in chapter four, and we'll, we'll, you know, which has some like a little organic chemistry. Like, what do you see with this? Like, if you remember, there's an electron pair here, just to give you a clue about this bond. What what do you have with this? Resonance. Right. There's a resonance structure to that, and we'll we'll talk about that later. I don't know why I wanted to point that out now, but I. So peptide ends are not the same. Somebody, I think I covered this. Somebody came and asked me a question today when we were talking about directionality of biomolecules, right? <laughs> so for peptides, each, remember each amino acid is going to have an amino, free amino group and a free carboxy group. So when you form a series of peptide bonds, the peptide itself or protein itself is going to have an amino terminal in or also called the amino terminus or N terminus and a carboxy terminal in or the carboxy terminus or C terminus. Okay. And sequences, when you see sequences of, of amino acids to describe a peptide or a protein, they're always listed from the amino terminus to the C terminus. So it's always got that same directionality, which happens to correspond to the DNA coding sequence from, you know, the, the, the coding sequence is five prime to three prime. Those codes line up with how the protein is produced in the ribosomes, five prime to three prime, codes for the amino terminus to the C terminus also. So it kind of all lines up. So naming peptides start, like I just said, with the N terminus. If you use the full amino acid names, such as cereal, glycyl, Tyrosyl, anilyl, leucine. That would be one way to name it. Oh, that's kind of hard to say if you're just spouting off peptides. At least it's short. You're not going to name a whole protein like that. That would, I could spend all class period naming like myoglobin that way. Using the three-letter codes, you, you'll see it like that, or you can use single-letter codes like this. So it's good. You're going to need to know these because in test questions, I might have it amino acids listed as these or these, okay, for your answers or, or in the question. So you'll want to be able to interpret the three-letter code or the single letter. But I'm not going to have them there where you have to write them all down individually. So peptides have a variety of functions. Insulin is a peptide. It's actually two peptides that are bound together by disulfide bonds. And I think it's got a molecular weight of about a 7,500 pounds. So it's a, it's, a, it's a hormone, right? What does it do? It controls your blood sugar, right? Oxytocin, childbirth, that's another peptide hormone. Sex peptide, root climbing. We discovered that. There's neuropeptide, substance P, which is pain. 
antibiotics, polymycin B for gram negative bacteria, or bac bactericin for gram positive for all peptides. Have these functions. Protection against toxins for the main function. Chlorotoxins. So these are all toxins produced by other organisms. So that's protection against toxins. Protection via toxins. Right? So those are all peptides that, that are toxins. Polypeptides are covalently linked amino acids. And they're going to have such things as possibilities or cofactors. Cofactors are functional non-amino acid components. And typically, a lot of those you'll see are, are like coenzymes, or what you guys probably know of as vitamins, right? So coenzymes are organic cofactors, and they make up the vitamins. Co cofactors also include metal ions and or organic mo molecules. But the metal ions, you'd have like a metalloprotein requires magnesium or something to, to have its shape. So coenzymes are the organic cofactors. Examples of those are NAD. Anybody know what NAD is? Nicotinamide. Nic nic nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is in lactate dehydrogenase. It's a cofactor required. And when we get to the metabolism chapter, you'll, you'll see exactly how these cofactors work mechanistically in the chemistry. Prosthetic groups, a lot of these coenzymes can be prosthetically, you know, covalently attached to the peptides. And that's what it says here. They're covalently attached cofactors. Heme and myoglobin, uh, other prosthetic factors. You guys know what biotin is? Hmm? Isn't it for strong nails and stuff? So biotin, it, it's a cofactor. We use it in the lab a lot. You can have biotinylated proteins. Yes. We did leave our flash drive. So biotin is covalently attached to lysines. You form a, an amide bond with a lysine, and it has, it's like a, a cofactor on a chain, and it actually swings back and forth between two parts of an enzyme carrying carboxyl groups. But we'll, we'll learn about that later. And then there's other modifications. And those can include phosphorylation. You can add lipids and sugars to proteins, so ton, tons of different modifications. And you can see polypeptides vary in size and number from like cytochrome C, it's about 12,000 Daltons, all the way down to this protein called Titan, right? Which is about 2,993,000 Daltons. And this is actually like the spring in our muscle fibers. So it's super huge and everything in between. And then conjugate, classes of conjugate proteins include lipoproteins, which have lipids attached to the proteins that include beta-1 lipoprotein in the blood. Glycoproteins have carbohydrates attached. A lot of immunoglobulins have carbohydrates attached. Not just immunoglobulins, but your blood types. A lot of those are carbohydrates that, that determine your blood type. Phosphoproteins are critical and cellular regulation and intracellular signaling. So phosphates are added to different proteins all the time. And I, I guess some examples, casein in milk, but you'll, you'll hear protein kinase. Do you guys remember what kinases do? They phosphorylate proteins. Well, protein kinase is activated by protein kinase kinase. So that phosphorylates protein kinase. So protein kinase can be a phosphate protein. Protein kinase kinase regulates protein kinase, which is regulated by protein kinase kinase kinase. So, <laughs> I'm serious, that's how this terminology goes. So phosphate groups are endemic of regulation of protein functions inside cells. Hemoproteins just mean they have heme attached. And you have that in hemoglobin. Can anybody think of another protein that has a heme group attached to it? That's analogous to hemoglobin. No, no ideas. Myoglobin. What about myoglobin? You guys heard of that? 
Yeah, my globin's in muscle, it stores oxygen in your muscle. Hemoglobin delivers oxygen to your muscles. So I think in chapter five, we learn about the differences between the two and, and why one is better at delivering oxygen, one's just better at storing oxygen. Flavoproteins have these flavin nucleotides that, you know, associated with them, like FAD. You guys heard of the, that cofactor? And then metalloproteins all have some sort of, you know, metal ion associated with them. Iron is ferritin. Zinc requires alcohol. Alcohol dehydrogenase requires zinc, not vice versa, and so forth. Calmodulin modulates calcium and needs calcium. Molyb molybdenum? I, I can't see that. Is dinitrogenase and then copper plastocyan. So, what to study about peptides and proteins? What, what do we study about peptides and proteins? Is what is the sequence and composition? So, what's the easy way to sequence proteins? If you know the cDNA sequence, it's super easy to sequence proteins. So, I don't know. If last time I taught this class, we used the other book and. And that book that teaches you like this really tricky puzzle solving way to sequence the proteins where you're using proteases, specific proteases and chemical cleavage so you can derive sequences of short proteins. This book doesn't do that so I'm not going to put that on your test because it focuses more on the more modern techniques. You can M use MSMS to determine sequences of proteins. How, how does it find its native fold? And what a fold is the final shape a protein takes, and its native fold is the, the, the fold it's naturally found in. How does it achieve its biochemical role? How does it function? How's its function regulated? Phosphorylation regulates a lot of functions, and other things do too. How does it interact with other macromolecules? Other macromolecules can regulate functions. How is it related to other proteins? Where is it localized within the cell, and what are its physical chemical properties? So, mixture of proteins can be separated, and that's the first thing if you're studying a protein is you want to isolate and purify that protein. And separation relies on differences in physical and chemical properties such as charge, size, affinity for some ligand, solubility, hydrophobicity, thermal stability, and chromatography is commonly used for prep separation, so for preparing a large scale of one pure protein, we're going to use chromatography. Example of thermal stability is in the clinical lab, there's different isozymes. They all have the same function, but if you want to measure a specific isozyme in the blood, for example, alkaline phosphatase, if you heat that plasma sample up to six, uh, 65 degrees, you're going to kill any of the, the bone-derived alkaline phosphatase. So that's one way you can determine bone-derived alkaline phosphatase activity by measuring the activity before you kill it and then after you kill it, and you can determine the, the bone-derived alkaline phosphatase activity that way. Hydrophobicity, you can partition it into a different uh, phase like using phase chromatography and so forth. Same thing with solubility. Solubility, a lot of, I think I talk about it up in here, but to pure, you could, one method of purifying, normally the first step in purifying a protein is you're gonna do some sort of precipitation reaction where you use different concentrations of a salt that will precipitate different proteins at different concentrations of that salt. If you guys are taking proteins class, anybody? This semester, because so, I changed it probably since you took it. So I have people purify IGY from eggs, and you precipitate those. First, you precipitate lipids out of the eggs with a, a polyethylene glycol. Then as you increase the concentration of that polyethylene glycol, you precipitate the, the antibodies out of those eggs. So. Continue. Column chromatography, just a way to separate proteins based on how well they're attracted to this stationary phase. Chromatography typically has two phases. You have a stationary phase and a mobile phase. And what separates the analytes in column chrom chromatography is their differential affinity for that stationary phase versus the mobile phase. In this example, 
A, analyte A gets retained the longest, so you can separate it from B and C, which don't get as separated. C is, has the least affinity for the stationary phase, so it elutes first. B is the next, has the next higher affinity for the stationary phase, which will loot next, and A gets retained the longest, which you're able to separate the three. And there's a number of different methods in chromatography for the stationary phase. Did anybody tell me any examples? Do you guys cover any of this in organic before? Hmm? Yeah, so what kind of stationary phases are there? Do you know? So there's partition chromatography. If you, anybody ever heard of reverse phase or normal phase, HPLC? So that has to do with the analyte's ability to partition into like immiscible phases. So in reverse phase chromatography, the, the, your stationary phase has all these long chain hydrocarbons on it. So you have a, a hydrophobic phase, you know, attached to the stationary phase, or the stationary phase is a hydrophobic phase, and you run a hydrophilic mobile phase, something like methanol or some aqueous, something along those lines, and the ability for analytes to partition into the non-aqueous to the aqueous phase separates them, basically. There's also, and normal phase is just the opposite, where you coat normally silica with some kind of aqueous solvent so the silica is coated in, in water and then you use a non-aqueous mobile phase and it's just the opposite. So other, or what you've probably done in organic chemistry is TLC using silica and that is, it's not partition, I forget what it's called and I'm bad at that. Basically you're using hydrogen bonding and polarity because it'll stick to the, the OHs on the silica if you have a lot of hydrogen bonding capabilities, the more hydrogen bonding and pol polar substances will stick longer and ones that aren't as polar will come right off. And I forget the term for that, which is bad because I'm bad at words. And then, so, then we have size exclusion chromatography and I know I got figures of that. And then ion exchange chromatography, which is the next slide. So ion exchange is where you're using ions in the analytes you want to separate. And you have a charged resin, in this case it has negative charges, so it's cation exchange chromatography, where the, the cations will ex that are on the resin will exchange for cations in your analyte. And cat ion exchange chromatography is nice because what can you do to elute or stick molecules to the resin, do you know? How can you change a substance's charge? Specifically like amino acids or proteins, do you know? It's in chapter two. What can you do to alter the charge of a molecule that has ionizable groups? <laughs> yeah, you, you alter the pH. So you, you can alter the pH of an amino acid, per se, till you get to the PI. Do you remember, remember what the PI is? That's the, middle. the isoelectric point where it has no net charge. So if, if it has no net charge, it's not going to be likely that it's going to stick to or exchange for the counter ion, right? Does that make sense? So, one, so what you could do if you have two molecules you want to separate, and they're both charged, you adjust one till you adjust the pH till one is not charged and run it through, it'll come right off while the other one will stick to the column. And then you adjust the pH of the mobile phase to, to where the one that's stuck to the column will come off because it won't be charged anymore. Or you can just flood it with salt and then it'll elute also. So different ways to elute things off of ion exchange chromatography. Separation by size or size exclusion chromatography. You have these porous polymer beads that are often made of sephiros and they have very specific pore sizes inside the beads. And what happens is large molecules can't go through the beads. And I hate this picture because the, the, they're not just lines going through the beads. They're, they go all different ways. They, Right here, they make them look, just go straight down. But what happens is the large molecules go just around all the beads, so they have a much shorter distance to go. They can't fit inside the holes 
and get trapped by the beads that the small molecules will. Small molecules can go in and then come out, go in and out, and they have a much longer distance to come before they'll get eluded. So as you apply them to the column, small molecules get trapped by the beads. They'll slowly work their way down. Larger molecules will come right through. And if anybody wants a demonstration, just come see me in the lab. We've got a, a size exclusion column set up with uh, dextrin that's dyed blue, so it's a large dextrin, and vitamin B that's, that's a, a yellow or red color. I forget. <laughs> but you can see the color separate, and it's, it's neat. So come see me if you want to see a demonstration of the size exclusion chromatography. And separation by affinity is where you use some natural ligand receptor binding activity between two molecules, such as you can have, you can coat, coat a solid phase with an antibody and it'll grab whatever it, it grabs, what the antibody was raised against. Or you can coat it with a ligand and run the cell lysate through and your receptors to that ligand will bind to that and so forth. One, one of the common ways to, to produce recombinant proteins is you add a polyhistidine tag at one of the ends of the protein that you're going to produce. Now polyhistidine will coordinate nickel, so what they have are nickel columns and anything with a his tag will stick to that nickel. And does anybody have a chance to go over structures of the R groups on amino acids? Anybody know what the histidine R group is? It's an imidazole. So it's got an imidazole group. If you have polyhis tags, a protein with a polyhis tag stuck to the solid phase, the way you elute that, or an easy way to elute that, is if you flood the mobile phase then with imidazole and it will displace all the histidines bound to the, the stationary phase. Does that make sense? Okay. Electrophoresis for protein analysis. Who, who here has done electrophoresis? I know some of you, many of you probably have. So what is electro, well, I guess I have it up there. I can't ask you. <laughs> Unless I make you guys read the, the things. So we put an electric field on the proteins we want to separate. And typically we use a gel as a solid support because that gel will help re retain larger proteins or molecules. While it pulls, the smaller ones will travel faster. You apply electrical field and it's going to pull proteins according to their charge. And the gel matrix hinders the mobility of proteins according to their size and shape. So two ways to separate based on charge and size and shape. And typically a page looks like this. And they gave me this little movie I can show you if I know how to do it. Here. Oh, it's going to harm my computer. My browser has been upgraded. Oh, I'm sure you guys know this already. But this book gave me all these little things, so we'll see how it works. SDS polyacrylamide gel for research is a powerful tool which resolves proteins according to their molecular weights. Because proteins differ in size, shape, and charge, a protein sample is first denatured with the anionic detergent SDS. When a sample is heated, the SDS molecules bind to the proteins and cause them to unfold. The denatured proteins become uniformly coated with negatively charged SDS molecules, so they all have a similar shape and charge to mass ratio. So do you guys understand what this what they're doing here? So this is the most common form of, of uh, uh, electrophoresis you'll do with proteins. SDS page, SDS polyacrylamide gel. 
And the SDS, the whole purpose of that is to unfold the proteins, it kind of linearizes it and coats it with a negative charge. So the amount of charge is basically proportional to the amount of length there. So with this way, it kind of normalizes any shapes or, or charges already on the protein molecule. And so everything gets, will separate based on its charge and, and length, basically. So that's why they do this. There's also native protein gel electro electrophoresis, which is much harder than SDS because those proteins you don't unfold, they're just going to separate by their shape and their charge. But this is SDS page electrophoresis. Ah, where did it go? There it is. If a protein is composed of several subunits, the SDS not only unfolds the protein, but also dissociates the protein into its individual polypeptide chains. <coughs> the mixture of denatured proteins is then transferred from the tube and loaded into a well that's been cast in the top of a polyacrylamide gel. In an electric field generated by a power supply, the negatively charged polypeptides migrate through the gel toward the positive electrode at the bottom of the gel. The migrating polypeptides are retarded by the tangled network of polyacrylamide. Smaller polypeptides travel more easily and quickly through the pores in the network than do larger polypeptides. Because the polypeptides have similar charge to mass ratios, the distance they travel through a gel is dependent only on molecular weight. Based on this principle, proteins are separated according to their sizes with low molecular weight proteins having greater mobility than high molecular weight proteins. So SDS, like you just saw, it's sodium do dodecyl sulfate, which is a ter detergent. So it has 12, it's like a, a sulfate basically with a 12 carbon hydrocarbon attached to it. So it's gonna form micelles, they bind and unfold the proteins, giving the proteins uniformly negative charge, and the native shape of proteins doesn't matter at that point. And the rate, like we just saw, it only depends on their length. So, and you'll get separation similar to this. And this looks like a separation actually of a protein prep. We have in uninduced cells. So typically when you're doing a recombinant protein prep, you're gonna have a group of cells that you induce the protein expression in. Uninduced cells look like this. So, so you can see this is the protein of interest that you're producing. This is the induced cells. You take a soluble crude extract you have a large portion of the protein you're interested in. You're going to run it through a precipitation reaction to partially purify that protein. And then anion exchange purifies it more. Cation exchange will purify it again. And then super pure protein after at that point. So that's how in the industry you're going to prepare recombinant proteins with that many you know, steps typically. And actually, you'll use a page gel to analyze your steps along the way to look at your purity. And you can analyze, like in this example, it's fairly pure, but you have this contaminating band there. So. And then you can also calculate molecular weight 
of a protein using this. When you use a standard, you can draw, make a standard curve, the log of the molecular weight, and then look at the relative migration and determine it for the unknown. But I don't think you have any problems like that on the test, just so you know. Another way to, to separate proteins is by separating it by charge. And what you can do is isoelectric focusing. Did I discuss this already a little? Probably not. You can use isoelectric focusing to separate, separate proteins by charge. What you do is you have a solution with a, with a pH gradient, or a strip rather. A lot of, back in the old days, they would make tubes with a pH gradient from one end of the strip to the other. And there's ampholytes that cause that pH gradient. If you put it under a charge, you'll get a, a nice gradient from one pH to the next. And then you pipette just a spot of the protein you want to separate, the sample you want to separate, subject it to a high field, high, high voltage field. And those proteins will migrate through the pH gradient until they reach the point where they have no net positive or net negative charge, right? They're going to migrate either to the anode. You guys know this is the anode? Because I always get it confused. It it's, looks like a cathode because it's got the cat on it, the, or the positive, and then the negative's there. But the, the, the anions go to the anode. The cations go to the cathode. So, but anyway, so you'll separate proteins based on their isoelectric point running them through electrophoresis through that pH gradient. And then once you do that, what you can separate them further in what's known as two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. First dimension is separating based on their isoelectric point. Then you can put that into a polyacrylamide gel and run it like you did just a page gel we saw before the SDS page. And you separate each spot based on their electric, uh, molecular weight, and you end up with a gel like this with a lot of little spots. And that's called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So, and then if you want to analyze these further, you can cut these little spots out and uh, dissolve the gel and run them through a mass spec, and you can determine the sequence of each little spot. Sequence or modifications on each spot. Like, if you see these little lines like this, a lot of time, those are proteins that are phosphorylated, right? Because those phosphate groups are going to alter the PI because they're ionizable groups. So they'll be shifted along the pH gradient, but they all come out pretty much near the same molecular weight because phosphate doesn't have that significant of a weight when you're looking at proteins. Does that make sense? So. Spectroscopic de detection of amino acid or aromatic amino acids. So what are the aromatic amino acids? I got them up there, don't I? <laughs> so we got phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. So a lot of aromatic compounds will absorb UV light, right? So that's what's used. You can determine pro or estimate protein concentration based on its absorbance in UV. Protein typically, proteins typically will absorb maxima around 275 to 280 nanometers. So who here has measured DNA concentrations? What's that ratio? 260, 260. 260 to 280. So what does that tell you? The purity. Your purity of your DNA. You look at the 280 because that tells you how much protein is contaminating it. So the higher that ratio, you want it to be around 1.8 to 2 for DNA, right? And the higher that ratio means you don't have a lot of protein. The more protein you have, the lower that ratio is, and the more dirty your DNA prep was. So tryptophan and tyrosine are the, the chromophores that contribute the most to that. If you remember, tryptophan has that indole ring. Tyrosine has a phenol ring, basically. Concentrations can be determined by UV visible spectrometer using Beer's Law. So you can just determine the concentration based on its absorbance at 280, typically. And these, this next slide shows you the, 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 the absorption spectra of both tryptophan and tyrosine. And then phenylalanine is really not much. Specific activity is the activity divided by the total protein. There can be used to assess protein purity also. And 
I forget what this figure about is that this has more activity than this, right? If, you, if the red molecules are the active protein molecules, you know, the, the activity divided by the total protein, both of these basically have equal activity, but this one has more specific activity because it has a total, a lot less total protein. So, protein sequencing. So it's essential to further biochemical analysis that we know the sequence of the protein we are studying, right? So proteomics has been going on big and for a while now, and they've come up with incredible techniques to sequence and determine modifications on proteins. So it's easy to just generate the actual sequence from DNA sequence. We've sequenced the genome, and it's, e it's, e it's easy to find the open reading frames, and you can put together the you know, what amino acid goes where and put together the proteins that way. And one way to do it directly, the classical method to do it directly from peptides is Edmund degradation, which you have successive rounds of N-terminal modification, cleavage, and identification. It can be used to identify protein of, with a known sequence. Mass spectrom spectrometry is more of better more modern method. Maldi MS and ESI MS can precisely identify the mass of a peptide and thus the amino acid sequence. And Maldi, anybody know what that is? So that's matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. And ESI is just electrospray ionization. So both of these front terms just describe the method of ionization because in order to do mass spec, you have to have ions. So both of these just describe the method of ionization of your analytes. And then MS is just mass spectrometry. And can be used to determine post-translational modifications also. So this is an example of Edmonds degradation. You have your peptide. At a high pH, you react it with phenylisothiocyanate. It reacts with the N-terminus. Then you drop the pH. And this will come around and attack that and cleave the N-terminus. You can purify this from the solution and then identify it either with TLC or HPLC or mass spec also. So you do that it, with different rounds. You can kind of chip away at this sequence and determine the sequence that way. So, but it's kind of a long, laborious process. Mass spec, however, so you have some, some sort of ion source. This looks like an e electrospray ionization source. Typically, they're going to be coming off a chromatography column, uh, HPLC type column. And it'll spray your solution in there, which generates a charge. It might degrade some of the, the, the spectrum. And it sprays it into where you have a vacuum. And then you're going to, this figure doesn't really go into that much detail, but typically you have like a repeller that's going to repel any of the ions you have here down a vacuum and for time of flight mass spec anyways, it just measures the amount of time it takes to get to the end of the tube, the vacuum tube, and hit a detector. There's also what's known as quadrupole or ion trap, but that's beyond this class today. <laughs> But then, so this is one way for mass spec, and you'll generate the spectra of the peptide that you shoot down the, the column. But an even more modern me method is where they do MSMS, where you do two successive rounds all at the same time of mass spectrometry, where you'll isolate different com components that you spray into the separation with one MS. Typically, it's quadrupole. And then that'll go through a collision cell where you, where you bombard it with something like argon, a heavy non-reactive compound. Argon will break it apart into smaller daughter ions, and then it'll go through it again and to the detector. You can detect the mass of the daughter ions also. And you can keep doing that with different setups. There's, you can like basically break it down to its individual components. Each peak you select, you can break it down and identify what that is. So you can determine the whole sequence and modifications of a peptide, basically. So. 
So protein sequences as clues to evolutionary relationships. Sequence of homologous proteins from a wide range of species can be aligned and analyzed for their differences. So, we're say, so we can look at one protein that we see across different species, and you'll see differences among those, but then you'll see the similarities too. So those similarities are going to tell you what? Where you see similarities in proteins across species. Yeah, so those are like the highly conserved areas. What do you think those specific sequences would be important for, or amino acids? They're most likely going to be important for the function of that protein, right? There's a lot of, a lot of other amino acids you can substitute that aren't going to matter. Like you can isoleucine with leucine. It's not a big of a change, but if you substitute isoleucine with glutamic acid, that might be a big change, right? Does that make sense? It's isoleucine hydrophobic, glutamic acid has a negative charge. Might make a big difference. So difference might indicate evolutionary divergences and you can trace back, you can trace back with those phylogenic trees. Have you seen those? Where you have like, like the same protein and it traces it back based on sequence differences to evolutionary, you know, compatriots or whatever you would call them. So, like our common ancestral proteins, basically. So, and then that's the end of chapter three. We'll jump ahead to chapter four to try to stay on schedule. Unless anybody wants some water or bathroom, because I'm thirsty, but I got whiteboard. Care I can drink. So chapter four. So we're going to look at the structure and properties of the peptide bond here. I already gave you a clue about that, right? What is it about the peptide bond? Nitrogen with the carbonyl, so yeah, there's, there, there's, there's resonance there, right? Structural hierarchy in proteins, structure and function of fibrous proteins, structure analysis of globular proteins and protein folding and denaturing. We'll look at it in this chapter. So unlike most organic polymers, protein molecules adopt a specific three-dimensional conformation. That's going to be critical for its function. The structure is able to fulfill a specific, specific biological function. <laughs> and it's called its native fold. This three-dimensional structure is called its, its native fold or conformation. Native fold has a large number of favorable interactions within the protein. And there is a cost and conformational entropy of the folding of the protein into one specific native fold. What is this conformational entropy that we're talking about? And how is that a cost? So we have one protein that's all jumbled up into one specific three-dimensional shape. What do you lose in that? Huh? It, yeah, so if it was all just one string, you got rotation around all those bonds and it's disordered. So you're losing all that entropy to, to have one specific. So you're gaining entropy elsewhere and these are the favorable interactions with proteins is this one is this hydrophobic effect so that long chain of amino acid the R groups are going to be sticking out everywhere in the water unless they're buried in the center of the protein if they're hydrophobic right so and this they believe is one of the the main re, one of the biggest drivers for protein folding is this hydrophobic effect so you, you release the water molecules from the structured solvation layer around the, mole, the, the molecule as the protein folds, it increases its net entropy. That's why globular proteins, like we haven't introduced yet, but the term globular, what does that bring to mind? Like little globs of oil, right? Little round drops. And that's basically the, 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 the shape of globular proteins are basically just little round globs. 
And what that does, if, that, if you remember, oil forms those little drops. Why? Because that decreases the surface area of what it has to interact with the water. So it decreases the surface area of the organized water around that structure. Same thing with globular proteins. All those hydrophobic R groups are going to be buried to the center of the protein, so they're not going to have to interact with the water. And you, you gain a lot of entropy from the, the solution that way. Okay, The water itself, there's less of it that has to be ordered around the protein. Hydrogen bonds. You find those amide bonds that form the peptide bonds have a lot of free NH groups and, and those carbonyl groups that are there for hydrogen bonding. So you get a lot of hydrogen bonds. And you'll see in alpha helices and beta sheets, those structures are based on hydrogen bonds between the, the peptide bonds themselves. London dispersion forces, medium range weak attraction between all atoms contributes significantly to the stability of interior of the protein. So we get that. And then electrostatic interactions, you'll get charge, charge interactions that help them form its shape, including salt bridges, buried in the hydrophobic environment strongly stabilize the protein. So, so if you have charged particles within the hydrophobic environment, they're going to form a real tight bond because they'll be, you know, stabilizing themselves when surrounded by that hydrophobic environment. <clears throat> so there's four levels of protein structure. This is your primary structure, which is what? Huh? Yeah, it's just the sequence of amino acids is your primary structure. The next level of structure is your secondary structure, and that includes localized structures, such as alpha helices and your beta sheet structures are considered secondary structures. Those secondary structures will fold amongst themselves to form tertiary structure, which is one complete polypeptide folded chain. When multiple polypeptide chains come together, you get your quaternary structure. And this looks like an example of a hemoglobin. So you have four hemoglobin peptides form one hemoglobin molecule. OK? Does that make sense? So, so structure of the peptide bond. The structure of the protein is partially dictated by the properties of this peptide bond. So the peptide bond is, is a resonance hybrid of the two, two canonical structures, right? So the resonance causes these peptide bonds to be less reactive compared to esters, for example, and it causes them to be rigid and near planar. You have this partial double bond character that runs through that peptide bond. So that's an energy barrier you have to overcome if you want to rotate around that. Those are very rigid and pretty much considered just planar. And to exhibit a large dipole moment in the favored trans configuration, because they, they favor this trans configuration. So if you, like in an alpha helix, for example, the whole helix ends up being a lo long dipole. And I think we got figures in that in the future. But this is basically the resonance of the peptide bond, right? So you have electrons here in the nitrogen. They can drop down to form a double bond between the two. And then the carbonyl will come up, and you get a charge on the oxygen and a charge on the nitrogen, right? And that's the resonance structure with that. So in reality, you have a partial double bond character between the, the, the oxygen, the carbon, and the nitrogen. So th these electrons are pretty much shared throughout those three molecules or not three molecules, three atoms, <laughs> right? And this is a, the old book's picture. I think I, I like the way, because it, it shows you the, the actual pi bonds and how they're really just shared across that plane. So, <clears throat> so you have to put energy, significant amount of energy into this to get it to rotate around that double bond, or partial double bond. Rotation around the, the peptide bond isn't really permitted, and rotation around bonds connected to the alpha carbon is permitted. And you can have what's known as the phi angle around the alpha carbon and the amide nitrogen, and the psi angle is ar around the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon bond. So those are the two, two 
two bonds that you'll get rotation around. So in a fully extended polypeptide, both phi and psi are 180 degrees, but you'll see that these phi and psi angles, there's specific patterns that they'll, they'll have that you can plot in what's known as a Ramachandram, <laughs> something like that. I can't say its name, but the plot that plots these, and you'll see common phi and psi angles that it res it resides within specific secondary structures like alpha helices, beta sheets, anti-parallel beta sheets, parallel beta sheets, or collagen triple helix, things like that. And this just shows you phi and psi angles and where the peptide bond exists. So some of the phi and psi combinations are very unfavorable because of steric crowding. So you can't see it in, in here. But for example, like if we flip this around again, so it would interfere with, with that, right? The R group, it can interfere with the R group or you can have the oxygens and the hydrogens interfere based on the angles that they're around. And the Ramachandran plot, <laughs> is that how you would pronounce it? Anybody want to correct me? Ramachandran? That sounds better than what I said. I said it very American. <laughs> so Ramachandran plot shows the distribution of fine psi angle, dihedra angles that are found in a protein. It shows common secondary structure elements. And you can reveal regions of an unusual backbone, backbone structure. And you get plots like this. So typically your, your parallel beta sheets will be found here, anti-parallel there. <clears throat> your right hand twists beta sheets are there. And then collagen helices will be found there. Left handed alpha helices you can find there, right handed there. And then, so it's basically just plot the, the fine psi angles like that. And this shows you a specific protein. What is it? It's a pyruvate kinase from a rabbit and shows you where all the amino acids reside in this. So a lot of beta sheets in there with some alpha helices. So the secondary structure I already told you refers to the local spatial arrangement of the polypeptide backbone. Two regular arrangements are common, the alpha helix and the beta sheet. Both are stabilized by hydrogen bonds between nearby residues. And when I say stabilized by hydrogen bonds, they're not the R groups. It's always the, 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 the peptide bond groups, like your amid nitrogen or carbonyl carbon, the oxygen there on that carbonyl, for, or the hydrogen bonds we're talking about, with both the beta sheet and the alpha helices. So alpha helices are stabilized between nearby residues, like every fourth, I think, residue forms a hydrogen bond, where beta sheets can be from far away, just neighboring beta sheets. And I got pictures that'll show you. Irregular arrangements of polypeptide chains are called random coils. So let's say you have a, a, a polylysine at, at pH seven, that's naturally gonna make form a random coil. Does anybody know why? So pH 7, lysine is going to have a positive charge. All those positive charges are going to repel each other, so they're not going to be able to form a nice alpha helis because of those positive charges are going to repel. But if you up the pH to about 11, that lysine is going to be neutrally charged. It'll form an alpha helix. So just little differences between the two. So the idealized fine psi angles for common secondary structures, these are idealized and I'm not going to make you memorize these. This is just a table from your book if, if you wanted to know. So the alpha helix is a helical backbone held together by hydrogen bonds between the backbone amides, nitrogen, and the N plus four amino acids. So right-handed helix with 3.6 residues per turn. And the peptide bonds are aligned roughly parallel with the helical axis. So side chains point out and away perpendicular from the hel helical axis. So this shows you 
right hand helix and left hand helix. Basically the R groups, the side chains project out and away from these helices. The, the hydrogen bonds are roughly in line with the helices and there's probably a picture, not yet, but like this. So you have about 5.8 angstroms or 3.6 residues and you can see the hydrogen bonds you have here is your, your amid nitrogen with the hydrogen and your carbonyl oxygen form the hydrogen bond and that's how they go around in the alpha helix. Side chains project outwards. And this is the front, these are all side chains. So for protein packing and, and protein ordering, you might see examples like this. So here we have a positively charged side chain on an amino acid. Second one, this is hydrophobic, hydrophobic negatively charged. You see how you have hydrophobic residues on one side of the helix charged on the other. So typically if you see a helix like this, this is either going to be buried to the center of a globular protein where the hydrophobics will want to be buried and this will be exposed to the surface of the protein where it will interact with the water, right? And this is called, anybody have a guess as what kind of helix this would be called? It is an alpha helix, but it's a specific type of helix. We talked about uh, detergents or a certain type of molecule. Huh? Detergents form micelles. You could think of these as micelles where it buries the hydrophobic residues to the center. But it's an amphipathic helix, <laughs> right? So that, that's what you would see as an amphipathic helix. Or sometimes you might see a similar helix like this. Instead of being buried to the center of a globular protein, this might face towards the center of a plasma membrane. This could, a lot of ion channels you'll see like this where you have polar hydrophilic groups buried, you know, form the, the pore and to the membrane you have hydrophobic residues too. So. And these are just specifics about the helices, about like their size. The inner diameter is about four to five angstroms, too small for really anything to fit through the helix itself. The outer diameter of the helix is about 10 to 12 angstroms, which you'll see later on, it fits perfectly into the major groove of DNA. So you'll, you'll see a lot of alpha helis secondary structure at DNA binding proteins or DNA binding motifs. And then residues one and eight align nicely on top of each other. And that's what we see here, kind of, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they're almost perfectly above each other. So, <clears throat> so sequence affects helix stability. Not all polypeptide sequences adopt the alpha helical structure. Small hydrophobic residues such as alanine and leucine are strong helix formers. Proline acts as a helix breaker. Why is that? Everything's always up there. <laughs> what is it about proline that's different than all other amino acids? Shape. Huh? Shape. It's shape. It's, it's a ring. It's not really an amino acid. It's an, uh, it's, it's, it's an amine. Right, so it forms that ring group. So you, you don't get rotation of phi and psi angles like you can with regular amino acids. So it's got a specific angle that it can have and it doesn't allow hel helices. You can have it in a helix and it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to break the helix. Like in a lipoproteins, it'll form a circular structure around the lipid droplet. But it breaks the helix structure so you can get a bend in, in the helix or it stops the helix altogether. Glycine also acts as a helix breaker because the R group is just a hydrogen, it's tiny, and supports other conformations also. And attractive or repulsive interactions between side chains, three and four amino acids apart will affect its formation also. Right, because they'll reside on top of each other. If you have three and four apart, you can, like here's four, if they were, they're attractive here, but if they were repulsive, they might not want to form a alpha helix.
And this is a table, table 4.2 shows you the propensity of amino acid residue take up of an alpha hel helical formation. And I'm not going to make you memorize those things. So helix dipole, this is what we were talking about before. If you recall, the peptide bond has a strong dipole. Carbonyl, oxygen is negative. The amide, hydrogen is positive. So when you stack those up on each other in an alpha helix, you get one side. You basically you polarize the whole thing. One side has more positive and one side is more negative. Like you get an alpha helix, so you have a, basically a large macroscopic dipole moment over to the whole helix. And negatively charged residues often occur near the positive end of the, the, the helix dipole. <clears throat> so it looks something like this, right? So the amino terminus will have a net positive charge, or not net, but a partial positive charge, and then carboxy terminus, a partial negative charge. So beta sheets. <clears throat> The, plan, the planary of the peptide bonds and tetrahedral geometry of the alpha carbon creates a pleated sheet-like structure. When we say pleated sheets, they, they kind of look like this. They're pleated, and they form these sheets, basically. Sheet-like arrangements of backbones are held together with hydrogen bonds between the backbone amides of different strands. So this doesn't show you the hydrogen bonding that's going on. If you had another pleated sheet next to it, they would be forming hydrogen bonds between each other. So these are the R groups project up and down out of the pleated sheet. The, 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 the oxygen and the hydrogens, this is a hydrogen coming at us, oxygen going away, oxygen coming at us, hydrogen going away. That's where you get your hydrogen bonds between the sheets. And they can run in both parallel or anti-parallel orientation. Two chains within a sheet, sheets are possible, so that's hence you get the anti-parallel beta pleated sheets versus parallel pleated sheets. In parallel beta pleated sheets, hydrogen bond strands run in the same direction. They both go the same direction in the C terminus, resulting in bent hydrogen bonds. In anti-parallel beta pleated sheets, the hydrogen bonds run in opposite, so one strand's going N to C, the other strand is going C to N. And the resulting is a linear hydrogen bond, which has a stronger, you know, interaction when they're linear, right? And this shows you the top view of an anti-parallel beta pleated sheet. Here you have the hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, hydrogen bonding to the carbonyl of the peptide bond, and, and likewise. So this is anti-parallel. So you can form these directly if you have a turn, a beta bend here directly in sequence, but it doesn't necessarily have to be directly in sequence. But here's where you get the hydrogen bonding between the, those. And if you notice again, <clears throat> these are your R groups. This one here, it's kind of in dashed lines, so that's projecting into this board. This one's projecting up at us. So they rotate what direction they go. They go in opposite directions as they go down the sequence, the R groups. <clears throat> and this is your parallel beta sheets. So these, these will never be directly in sequence. So you can't have a turn come around and do this. You'll have to have some other kind of structure, bring it back here somewhere, and then it could go to here, and then another one go to here. So these are just where they, they fold together. They form these parallel beta sheets. And you can see the hydrogen bonding here isn't perfect. So these are a higher energy type of high, or not higher the yeah, higher energy type of hydrogen bond. Thirsty. <laughs> beta turns occur frequently whenever strands and beta sheets change direction. And like if you had that anti-parallel beta sheet, you could have turns connecting them all. <clears throat> the 180 degree turn is accomplished with four amino acids. The turn is stabilized by hydrogen bonds from the carbonyl oxygen to the amide proton, proton three residues down the sequence. So you, you'll, you'll have, I got a picture in a second. Proline in position two or glycine in position three are common in beta turns. And that's because proline has that ring structure so it's fixed and glycine because it you know, has a hydrogen, so there's a lot of room there to have that turn. 
and this shows you both here. So you have the first one, the second one, in this example they have a proline, so there's the ring structure. So it's fixed like this to do the turn, and in this example they have a, a glycine, and the glycine makes this possible because its side chain is so small. So most peptide bonds not involving proline are in the tr trans configuration, about 99.95% of them are trans. For, fe for peptide bonds involving proline, about 6% of them are in the cis conformation, and most of these 6% involve beta turns. So proline isomerization is catalyzed by pro proline isomerase, and it, it's an enzyme that can just switch it from the trans position to the, to the cis. And do you see how that works? And that's going to drastically affect the, the conformation of that protein, right? So there's, these enzymes can regulate certain protein function just by changing this bond at a turn. And you can like hide an active site or a binding site for a regulatory protein or expose it. So. So circular dichromism analysis, also known as CD, it's a way basically to, 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 to measure the amount of alpha helix beta sheet in a particular protein. And what it does is it looks at the difference in absorbance between left and right cir circularity of polarized light. So you measure the, the absorbance with both and subtracts them and you can see, look at the difference. And that's how it works, basically. And chromophores in the chiral environment produce characteristic signals. CD signals from peptide bonds depend on the chain conformation. And you can actually, in real time, manipulate a protein and look at the change in conformation based on how you manipulated it. And this shows you CD spectroscopy. It shows you what an alpha helix beta conformation and a random coil. And this is an experiment they take you through the, the, the basically, they have polylysine existing entirely as an alpha helix. So they'll have a high pH polylysine. It'll exist mainly as an alpha helix like that. You can alter it to a beta conformation by altering the pH. And then a random coil is going to be at a more neutral pH to poly, polylysine. And this is the CD. Of, of all of those conformations of polylysine. <clears throat> protein tertiary structure refers to the overall spatial arrangement of atoms in the protein, and it's stabilized by numerous weak interactions of amino acid side change. Largely hydrophobic and polar interactions are going to occur and can be stabilized by disulfide bonds. What amino acid forms the disulfide bonds? No, glycine doesn't have a, it has a hydrogen for an R group. But disulfide bonds are going to typically have a, a sulfur, right? There's only two amino acids with sulfur. Do you guys remember what those are? Cysteine forms the, the it has a thiol group, so it's a SH, and that's able to form disulfide bonds. Methine is the other sulfur-containing amino acid. It can't form disulfide bonds because it's got a methyl group after the sulfur, right? So interacting amino acids are not necessarily next to each other in the primary sequence. They can be from long parts of the primary sequence. Just like those parallel beta strands aren't necessarily, they're never going to be next to each other in the primary sequence. They'll be from different parts of the sequence that happen to arrive together. There's two major classes of tertiary structure, fibrous and globular proteins. And uh, globular are typical water or lipid soluble globular. And fibrous proteins typically make up our uh, structural proteins like collagen, alpha keratin, and beta keratin are going to be fibrous. So, <clears throat> and that's, that's just the tertiary structures that are fibrous and globular. Yeah, two major classes are, are fibrous and globular. So.
So this is the overall structure of collagen, which is a fibrous. It forms a helices all by itself, but that, so, and it's not an alpha helix, it's a collagen helix. It's a little bit different, it's an elongated helix. And these helices form a triple helix where you have three of them that come together to form this proto-collagen and then that'll eventually form a collagen fiber. And this is looking down at the collagen triple helix, basically three different helices together. <clears throat> and then this shows you a water-soluble globular protein. Like I said, they're typically like little globs of oil or something in a spherical type shape. And that's because they have a hydrophobic core that interacts with itself and then a hydrophilic outer R, R groups that will interact with the solvent or water. So this one actually looks like myoglobin, I think. Is that what it is? Yep, spermware myoglobin. <coughs> so fibrous proteins from structure to function. So alpha helix cross-linked by disulfide bonds, we're going to see an alpha keratin. So the alpha keratin with the alpha makes alpha helices and we get more and more alpha helices, they'll, they'll form, he you'll, we'll see in a second. Beta conformation, soft flexible filamentous or sick silk fibrillin and those are beta keratin typically forms th those beta, beta conformation. And we have the collagen triple helix has high tensile streak without stretch in collagen You'll find it in, you know, all your connective tissue, basically. <coughs> this is the structure of alpha keratin that we find in hair. And basically, you have a keratin alpha helices, and it's the primary structure of the helical rods consists of seven residue repeats that are typically A, B, C, D, E, F, G, times, you know, N times, it's repeated, those seven over and over again. And where A and D are going to be nonpolar, nonpolar, which promotes association, right? A and the fourth one, D. So if you remember looking down at that helical projection, so every fourth residue on that keratin is nonpolar. So it's going to be an amphipathic helix with these always being together, which is going to promote association with the other alpha helices in the alpha keratin, which is why you get <clears throat> basically you'll get two coils, a coiled coil that will coil upon itself, and then these coils will form, come together and form protofilaments, which then come together even further and form a protofibular, and it's those hydrophobic interactions along with disulfide connections between the coils that form these really strong fibers that we see in our hair. So, <coughs> this is just a cross section of hair showing you the keratin and a double coil that, and those coils are packed together to form protofilaments. Form a protofibular and an intermediate filament and then eventually form the, the hair itself. And because they're held together with disulfide bonds, how can you change the structure of this overall hair? That used to be popular in the 80s. Perms. Perms. Perms, yeah. So what they do with that, has anybody ever smelt beta mercaptoethanol? No. Yeah. yeah. The beta mercaptoethanol, the, the perm stuff, or that smells the same, doesn't it? So basically that perm stuff breaks the disulfide bonds the same way you use beta mercaptoethanol to break the disulfide bonds and proteins that you want to analyze. And then you reform them to, after you add the wave to it. And that's something in your book, they, they show you that. So they reduce the disulfide bonds, which you end up with the thiol groups again. You curl it and then oxidize it again and then those curls will be fixed there or in a permanent like state, right? So collagen <coughs> is basically what makes up your connective tissue, right? 
tendons, cartilage, bones, and the cornea of your eye. Each collagen chain is a long, glycine and proline rich left handed helix. So you have the helices that are left handed, lots of repeats of glycine and proline. And the three collagen chains intertwine in a right hand helix to form a super helical triple helix. Triple helix has higher tensile strength than the steel wire of, of an equal cross section. Many triple helices assemble into a co collagen fibril. Do you guys remember when we were studying modified amino acids last time, I think I mentioned, certain, certain amino acids that are incorporated into, into collagen are modified. Do you remember how? So hydroxyproline, hydroxy groups get added to the prolines that are inserted, or once you've made collagen, you hydroxylate a lot of these prolines. And they add hydroxy groups on those R groups that are able to hydrogen bond with the other helixes next to them, and that's what makes it so strong, is those hydrogen bonds between helices. And I got this picture again. I must have copied it instead of moved it here. <clears throat> and this shows you pictures of the collagen fibrils. You have the heads here, the molecules, and these cross striate striations. And they all are sections of these triple helices together. And what I was talking about, 4-hydroxyproline in collagen, it forces the proline ring into a favorable pucker, offers more hydrogen bonding capability within the three strands of co collagen, and it's a post-translational process, processing. So that means once you make the peptide, the proline doesn't get hydroxylated until after it's part of that peptide. So this enzyme, proleal hydroxylase, adds the hydroxy group after it's already part of that polypeptide. And it requires alpha-ketoglutarate, molecular oxygen, and ascorbate, otherwise known as vitamin C, to do that oxidation. <clears throat> and this is a figure from that other book that shows you the hydrogen bonding between side chains. And you can have two different conformations within the proline also, the C endoproline and C exoproline. So this is the overall reaction with the vitamin C. So you get proline residue, alpha ketoglutarate, and oxygen and iron. It gets adds to the four hydroxy proline residue and you get succinate and then carbon dioxide. And then alpha ketoglutarate plus oxygen and ascorbate yields succinate and dehydroascorbate. So <clears throat> silk fibroin. Fibroin is the main protein in silk from moths and spiders, and basically it has an anti-parallel beta sheet structure. Small side chains, uh, you have alanine and glycine allow the close packing of these sheets. And the structure is stabilized by both hydrogen bonding within the sheets and London dispersion interactions between the sheets. And this is what the sheets look like. You have anti-parallel sheets, alanines all on one side that mesh together, and then the glycine side chains all on the other side also for the most part. So you have glycines meshing together and alanines meshing together. So with this protein you see a lot of the protein sequence is just alanine, glycine, alanine, glycine, al alanine, glycine, alanine, glycine, over and over and over again. A lot of structural proteins are just repeated. Lots of repeats of the same protein or amino acids. <coughs> Spider silk is used for webs, egg sacs, and wrapping the prey. Extremely strong material, stronger than steel, can stretch a lot before breaking, and composite material Fibrin rich crystalline parts and rubber like stretchy parts too. And then motifs or folds are specific arrangements of several secondary structural elements. 
You can have all alpha helix, all beta sheet, or a mixture of both. Motifs can be found as reoccurring structures in numerous proteins. So when we talk about in the future DNA binding proteins, you'll see helix turn helix is a common D DNA binding motif. Or anybody heard of zinc fingers? That's a common DNA binding motif also. Proteins are made of different motifs folded together. And this is an example of a beta, alpha, beta loop. So we have a, a beta strand that runs this way, turns into a helices, and then to another beta strand. So beta, alpha, beta loop. So, and that's one way you can get, what kind of beta strands are these? Parallel. Parallel, yeah. This is one way you can get parallel beta strands through that motif. <coughs> and then you have some other examples, typical connections, and an all beta motif. Those look like anti-parallel, where they're just turns and then back-to-back -back turns, kind of. Right-handed connections, these are parallel between beta strands. And then you can have twisted streak, twisted streaks, twisted beta sheets. So. <clears throat> and then some motifs can make up parts of other proteins, like the beta-alpha-beta beta loop. It's incorporated into this alpha-beta barrel that you'll see, and these are all motifs of uh, globular proteins. Is that clock right? Five minutes fast. Huh? Five minutes fast. Five minutes fast. Mm -hmm. oh, so we got 10 minutes? Four minutes? Oh. I guess we can stop here then. We've got 20 more slides. Ordinary structure. <laughs>